Good morning, everyone. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Latin American program and delighted to welcome you to this webinar, one of the first that we're holding in 2022. Happy New Year to everyone. In September of 2021, on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly, the presidents and foreign ministers of Panama, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic came together to launch the Alliance for Development in Democracy. This is an initiative that is aimed at democratic strengthening, economic growth and economic recovery, and addressing issues of mutual concern to these three countries, sustainable development, environment, trade, migration, and security. Behind the formation of the Alliance is a well-known but not, open, not often openly expressed fact that while the Biden administration has focused as its attention on the countries of Central America's so-called Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, other countries of the region are impacted by the crises there and shouldn't be ignored as the US government focuses on the root causes of migration to the United States from the Northern Triangle. And it's no exaggeration to say that the governments of Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic differ markedly from their counterparts in the Northern Triangle. All three presidents were invited to President Biden's Democracy Summit last month. And indeed, in his closing remarks, President Biden praised the alliance as, quote, an example of expiring commitment and partnership, unquote. It should be the case then that the pluralist and democratic traditions of these three nations will make them attractive as strategic partners for the United States, for Europe, especially in light of the pandemic induced reconfiguration of global supply chains. I'm delighted to welcome to this morning's discussion, three distinguished foreign ministers from the region. We will begin, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. We'll begin with uh, Foreign Minister Erika Muines, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama. She will be followed by Minister Rodolfo Solano, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica. And finally, Minister Roberto Alvarez, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Dominican Re Republic. And also I'm proud to claim him when he's not exercising his official duties. Um, Minister Alvarez is a founding member of the advisory board of the Latin American program. Um, there is translation, simultaneous translation into uh, between Spanish and English. Um, so please in the audience, feel free to tune in to the language that is um, most suited um, to you. And we will also accept questions from the audience via the chat. So Minister Moines, um, adelante, muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, it's, I, I'm delighted to be here and I'm grateful to, to start and kick off the conversation. Um, we start uh, as you were framing the the idea of our three countries in creating this alliance of for the development and democracy is particularly to strengthen our shared in democratic institutions and to unlock new opportunities for our people in our region. And that's particularly important. It's showing democracy next to results. Um, as democratic governments in Latin America and around the world face a number of growing challenges, and we all know what are the ones in our region, we're committed to working with the United States and other partners to show that democracy can, in fact, deliver results. Um, I was just reading before coming to, to this session uh, a wonderful study by the MIT on democracy and how democracy does cause growth. But it was also very interesting because in, in spite of actually creating growth, doesn't mean that you can sustain it. So we need to work hard in showing and showcasing what democracy is doing for us and that, that we cannot take it for granted, particularly um, in this day and age with all the electoral processes going on, with all the societies looking for uh, to, to, to have some true and symbolic idea that the, the, the democracy is actually working for all of us. So this means developing and implementing recovery policies 
to trigger investment and societal changes to prepare our nations to address future challenges that can be anything. It can be disease, it can be climate, it can be supply chain disruption. And we need to improve our society's resilience to address the challenges when they happen. And when you improve resilience in this front, you can also show up broader political systems and faith in that democratic rule. Um, there are a number of ways that we've thought of where you can structure uh, this positive platform. Uh, we've divided among ourselves within the political branch, the cooperation, and also sort of the trade and investment. Um, I want to speak a little bit specifically on the political front and some of the challenges that we're facing and how we can, and this alliance can help and contribute in that, in, in, in that discussion. The first one that you mentioned, uh, migration. Um, there's been uh, for 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 uh, for a number of decades uh, a very specific focus on the Northern Triangle migration. But the truth is, and I will share specific numbers. Panama saw last year 8,000. Uh, sorry, not last year. The year before, on 2020, 8,000 migrants cross our border. Last year, it was 140,000. We went from 8,000 to 140,000. The number clearly surpassed not only our capacity, but everybody's capacity. These are migrants that are going and arriving in South America, uh, mostly, mostly from the Caribbean, particularly Haiti. Um, and it's a situation that requires collective analysis and collective responsibility. No one country can deal with it. Um, we see them in Panama. They arrive sometimes after four and five countries, and we are the first country that gives them food, shelter, uh, that does a medical review, that biometric testing to understand if they might be, uh, if, if there is an alert uh, for them. And this platform, this alliance, it's, it's extremely useful in promoting that discussion. We have from Dominican Republic, which are the main neighbors of Haiti, and know firsthand the problems and the challenges that that nation is facing. And what we want to foster is a dialogue, a constructive one, and focusing on three aspects uh, one being the, the coherent migration policy that we've been advocating. You need to be coherent in terms of if you're promoting uh, migration to come to your country, particularly in South America, then you need to be prepared to support them. You cannot then look at the other way and not, and not provide care for them because then they endure a very difficult and dangerous journey that is not, that is not cared for and not provided by the originating countries. Um, there is also the concern that with, with all of us working together, we can also talk about security and having the dismantling of those criminal organizations that are, that are benefiting from the migration in the first place in, in ways that, um, that is extremely unfortunate. And it's only through collaboration that you can actually make sure that they that is being dealt with in an, an efficient manner. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. I know I have about five minutes. You'll let me know when it's a good time. OK, great. Um, so migration at the end, it's, um, it's certainly a, 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 a a wonderful example of how we can drive the conversation with that positive aspect, and that is proposals and, and solutions that we can deal and we can deal as a country. We can deal, the three countries can also involve more in a positive manner to make sure that we are all dealing with it in a coherent manner. Um, there are other uh, in, challenges that, that our countries are facing. And it is good, and then we think that this platform is ideal in fostering that conversation because through the political analysis and through the political platform that you can have with other regional partners, you can make sure that then you are receiving um, support and that support is translated into economic growth economic growth that we all need. So when we go back, for instance, to the issue of migration, the more growth that you can foster and develop in all of our countries, um, the, the more support that that migration will get and will not end up in a difficult situation as it, and it ends up now in Mexico, in the US, in Canada. 
Um, there are other examples where as a region we can come together. We are, we are looking forward to drive the conversations, for instance, in climate. Um, we are all facing the same challenges and Central America and the Caribbean is one of the hardest hit regions uh, in the world by climate change. But we have not managed to come together in a one coherent voice. So having this platform, getting everybody on board um, with clear initiatives that we can support, and the support can be something, for instance, the United Nations. So the three of us are now talking about some of our positions in the multilateral um, arenas, how we can make sure that we are uh, coordinated and that those positions can then be replicated in the rest of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. So these are, I think, wonderful examples that anywhere from a candidacy to driving economic growth, um, that this uh, alliance certainly is helpful and can, I think, at the end, the most important uh, manner is that you are making sure that that democracy it has proven results positive results that can be followed by other regional partners thank you thank you so much Canciller. next we'll turn to rodolfo solano costa rica thank you thank you for this opportunity i want to express my sincere appreciation to the Wilson Center, I think we are starting the new year in a really good way. Let me, let me uh, start saying that the Alliance is a very good example how to move from thoughts to action. Sometimes we expend too much time talking about issues, but I think the Alliance is a very good example how we can act with common values. Uh, last year, Costa Rica and Panama celebrate 200 years of independence life. And next coming 27th of February, Dominican Republic is going to celebrate 178 years of independence. I think the Alliance is a very good example how three countries understand the historical moment of our independence life. In that regard, I want to express that Costa Rica is totally committed to promote the adoption of a common view between our three countries, looking for the importance of strengthening democratic institutions based on the values and issues we share. Let me be clear, democracy is under attack. Let me be clear, Human rights are under attack. And let me be clear, freedom of press and expression is under attack. We need to respond in a smart and very strategic way. The regional situation was a call for action to find the best partners within our own vicinity, to work together to convene joint actions leading to prosperity, sustainable development, and economic reactivation and recovery. As it was mentioned on the IDEA report on the state of democracy in the Americas in 2021, there is a great concern with regards to the process of democratic deterioration in the region, intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic and visible through the weakening of the rule of law with lower quality of democracies, poor governance, high levels of corruption and impunity, weakened judicial powers, and with arbitrary restrictions on the freedoms of expression and press. In this context, Costa Rica with Panama and Dominican Republic proposed the creation of this trilateral space of flexible and casual dialogue, which is used as a consultative platform on the most important issues for our countries and the region, as my uh, colleague Erica just mentioned in her remarks. The Alliance is an informal association 
which aspires to promote a better communication and comprehension between our countries and strategic partners as the US and allows a flexible dialogue, a space to exchange points of views on a regular basis with the double purpose of providing mutual support and launch joint initiatives. After the formal adoption of the Alliance in New York in September 2021, and after two more summits, Costa Rica will host the fourth presidential summit of the Alliance on March 21st, where we, work, we will work together on the identification and priorization of the fundamental areas of cooperation with the Alliance. For this meeting, we have also extended an invitation to the United States, and we expect to have a high level participation to discuss together on ways to cooperate on the strengthening of democracy, address migration, improve security and combat corruption, tackle climate change, protect oceans, and increase economic growth and social labor opportunities, all of which are matters of the utmost importance for our countries. We celebrate the significant coincidences of our country's share with the Biden administration and look forward on working together in a strong partnership. Let me say again, in a strong partnership to address the critical challenges in the region. As President Biden said during the closing remarks on the Summit for Democracy, the creation of this alliance reflects our commitment and an inspiring partnership to cooperate in matters of transparency, human rights, economic development, and the strengthening of democracy in the whole region. Regarding with the cooperation pillar of the Alliance, which is being driven and coordinated by the government of Costa Rica, the three countries have recognized the value of cooperation and are determined to increase the trilateral synergies to collaborate in lines of action for an effective post-pandemic recovery within our countries and with regional partners. Costa Rica has promoted South-South and triangular cooperation in vital areas to generate green and inclusive development. At the same time, it has advocated with development partners together with other upper middle income countries for a measure of development consistent with our reality in order to allow access to non-reimbursable cooperation funds that contribute to overcoming the structural gaps that persist despite the achievements made as a country. That call remains fully valid and today, considering the health, economic, political, and social consequences caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which have exacerbated structural gaps, it has a sense of urgency to preserve progress and minimize the risk of further development setback. Considering that the support of international cooperation and solidarity are fundamental to guide the goals of sustainable development, Costa Rica believes that the concept of development in transition is a current response to escape the graduation trap and therefore to better address the profound regional challenges since on one hand, it is an approach to build a more appropriate measurement of development of a multidimensional nature according to the needs of each country. And on the other hand, it opens the possibility of laying the foundations for a fairer and more effective distribution of international development cooperation resources, as well as financing. And in this regard, I call different actors in the US Congress, in the US Senate, 
and in the same think tanks to understand and engage with this new cooperation paradigm. In this end, Costa Rica is also leading a call for the international community and financial institutions to increase extraordinary concessional financing for economy recovery, as well as better and new resources for climate adaptation and technological and digital transformation. During the last summit of the Alliance in Re Dominican Republic in December, the president agreed that the ministers of finance or economy convened a round table with the governors of the regional development banks to present a proposal of innovative mechanisms for a solid economic recovery. My dear friends, we are confident that the three countries that confront the alliance are reliable partners on the promotion of democracy, the defense of open societies, international law, and the paradigm of green, fair, sustainable, and inclusive development towards the great structural challenges of humanity, such as the current migratory situation and other facts. I'm very pleased to share with all of you these ideas to have driving the creation of this alliance and extend my personal gratitude to my dear friends and colleagues, the ministers of Panama and Dominican Republic, and of course, the Wilson Center for this opportunity. That is the first step, but we need to continue walking and working together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thank Minister you. Solano. Uh, Roberto Alvarez. Uh, thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you for organizing uh, this panel. Appreciate it very much. And um, want to extend uh, welcome to and uh, solidarity with uh, our partners, Erika Moines of Panama, who so graciously included at her background all of the flags being extremely <laughs> correct, which we did not. Thank you. And Rodolfo, thank you very much for the introductions. Let me just say, uh, Cindy, um, that the original ideas, as has been fleshed out by, um, stated by Erica and Rodolfo, of coming together, these three uh, countries, was A, to uh, gain, gain greater visibility uh, for the three countries. Uh, because we, the three countries, are um, Caribbean countries, um, um, economies that are growing, uh, democracies uh, that respect uh, the processes, uh, the values um, of democracy and of human rights. And uh, so we thought that it would it be indeed uh, uh, a great synergy to, to work together. Uh, and so far it has, it, in short four months, uh, we have uh, gained already uh, considerable attention. And I think it is worthwhile and that we deserve it to some degree uh, for the reasons, for good reasons. Um, having said that, before I, I launched into what my area, which is uh, mainly uh, trade and uh, investment, um, let me just say that uh, intra-regional global trade uh, up until 2010 was decreasing. In 2010, that was reversed. Um, and um, COVID did not generate uh, a trend towards regionalization that we're seeing now of production. It simply accelerated that trend. Uh, let me highlight four main factors that have marked this acceleration. Number one, climate change and sustainability, shorter production chains mean less CO2 emissions and less environmental impact. Number two, a digitization of processes, uh, increased pressure from consumers for faster deliveries and more personalized products. Number three, geopolitical reordering and the rise of protectionist policies. And number four, disruption in supply chains and the resulting impact in costs. Now, there are two main reasons that could potentially motivate companies to relocate. One, economic factors, 
These mainly impact the decisions of sectors such as textiles, clothing, furniture, electrical components, among other intensive in labor. And the other one is non-economic factors such as national security and competitiveness. These mainly impact the decision of sectors such as aerospace, semiconductors, medical devices, automotive, among others. This means that there will be sectors that will naturally transition into the region. And we have seen that already with a significant increase in foreign direct investment in textiles, plastics, and furniture, both in Central America and the Caribbean. Others, such as those depending on non-economic factors and those related to national security and competitiveness will entail a joint effort where all those involved stand to gain. This is where the, the alliance uh, comes into play. The three countries would be seventh, six, and 12. Uh, Costa Rica, seventh, the Dominican Republic, six, and Panama, 12th most important trading partner for the US in Latin America, respectively. But by combining the three, if we were one country, we become the third most important trading partner of the United States, only surpassed by Mexico and Brazil, both with a combined 340 million population, while we, the three countries, have a combined population of 20 million. Let me just give you some numbers. In two years, meaning 2018, two and a half years, uh, 2019, 2020, and half of 2021, in those two and a half years, um, Mexico uh, the trade balance with the United States was 1 trillion 524 billion. Uh, Brazil was 172 billion. And the three amigos were 86 billion before Colombia, which was 67 billion, Chile 66, and so on. So um, I think that we have a, um, an excellent um, track record to become um, a, a, an even better uh, trading partner with the United States so um, investments would also, which are already flowing, we need to find ways of enhancing that process uh, at the moment. So as we know, due to geopolitical issues, such, such as, as well as the current supply chain disruptions, the US is focusing on initiatives to help strengthen its supply chain with, executive order, uh, with an executive order 14017, on America's supply chain, President Biden started deploying significant efforts to making the US supply chain more secure, robust, and resilient. The order lays out a medium to long-term process for evaluating US supply chains, issues, and opportunities, analyzing potential solutions, and creating a strategy for eventual policymaking. The report focuses on four classes of products where American manufacturers rely on imports, some semiconductors, high capacity batteries, pharmaceuticals, and their active ingredients and critical miner minerals and strategic materials like rare earths. We're not starting from scratch. The three countries, the three amigos, Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic have a lot to offer to the US as partners in helping strengthen its critical supply chains. Both Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic have a strong manufacturing base of medical devices and electrical components. In Costa Rica, medical devices represent an average of 35% of all their exports. In the Dominican Republic, it's an average of 16%. The DR has also the presence of eight of the top 30 largest global manufacturers of medical devices. Panama has strong presence of key players in pharmaceutical sectors, and the service industry encompasses about three quarters of its GDP. In terms of minerals, our three countries have extensive deposits of gold, copper, silver, iron, iron, nickel, alloy, and others. Imports from Asia into the US 
have an average of 4% of US value in those imports, while 40% of US value added content on imports into the US from the DR CAFTA region. So from our region, it's 40% value added of US um, um, content, while it's only 4% from Asia. A stronger version is synonymous with greater, a stronger region is synonymous with greater insertion into US value into global supply chains. Our alliance is about enhancing what unites us both in political and economic commercial terms. Our individual worth is enhanced by collaboration. We all stand to gain. The US is by working with a block of friendly allied countries that share democratic values in strengthening its own critical supply chains and promoting a stronger political and commercial region. And our three countries by fostering trade and creating new employment opportunities that help mitigate migration and strengthen its economies. We're engaging relevant agencies in the US to start deploying working groups that help enhance US, the Alliance cooperation on global supply chains. A recently in Puerto Plata, recently December 11th, we formed a high level business council of the uh, main private sector in, uh, groups and individuals uh, within our Alliance. Uh, to engage private sector leaders within the US to help determine potential investment areas within the countries of the Alliance uh, that assist the overall strategy of the US to strengthen the resilience of critical supply chains. Thank you. Hey, Concierge Alvarez, thank you so much for that. We have a lot of really excellent questions that have come in from the audience, but I would like to start with uh, with two. Um, one is for Minister Solano that has to do with the upcoming elections in Costa Rica and with a change of government, a potential change of, um, of party leadership. Do you expect any um, changes perhaps in the orientation towards the alliance? Um, and for Roberto Alvarez, a question about the supply chain issues that you raised. Um, the Wilson Center has a wonderful report on nearshoring written by economist Richard Feinberg um, that proposes that the Caribbean basin, um, including the north of South America, Central America, the Caribbean, be considered as um, prime locations for uh, companies that are coming back from, from Asia and making supply chains more secure. So my question is really, whether you have seen any evidence that the Biden administration is serious, not only about reshoring, in other words, bringing manufacturing capacity back to the United States, but also uh, nearshoring. So let's start with those two questions and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Thank you, uh, Minister Solano. My, no, my, my pleasure. Let me, let me say that the alliance came to stay. In Costa Rica, we have already a very robust uh, public policies. And one of the most robust uh, public policies is related with uh, foreign policy. In the last uh, eight, uh, 80 years, the main uh, foreign policy pillars of Costa Rica are well known and very robust. And I think uh, already all the uh, candidates in one way or another way express uh, the support for this initiative. As I mentioned in my uh, remarks, the Alliance is the best example to move from talk to act. And today in the 21st century, citizens require from the, gover from the government's actions, not too much talks, but actions. And the Alliance is a concrete actions that we can show. And I am totally, uh, totally uh, convinced that the uh, next government in Costa Rica elect by democratic ways with a very high participation is going to continue by, by this same way. Hey, Roberto Alvarez. Um, thank you, Cindy. Um, well, first of all, as I said, in four months, we have already gained some, you know, considerable attention. President Biden, you mentioned uh, uh, his uh, 
mention of the alliance during the uh, summit on democracy. That by itself uh, shows the interest that I think that the United States is attaching to our, um, to our three countries. Um, but in addition, um, the United States is carrying out, um, I mentioned the executive order on a supply chain review. The United States is carrying out right now um, a, a, a research into what with a specific country, such as I, I understand, such as Japan, Brazil, uh, what areas, specific areas uh, in, of the supply chains can be um, included uh, for secure procurement into the United States. So there are evaluations ongoing right now, not just for reshoring, uh, but whatever you want to call it, friendshoring, nearshoring, et cetera, because it's a realization that you cannot bring back to the United States 100% of production. That's just, you, you have to find uh, other alternatives because it's the reality. So what we need to do now is to begin this process of evaluation with the United States. This is just at the beginning, initial stages now. Um, once we carry out these initial um, processes, then uh, the business council, hopefully there will be a business council established soon of the three uh, countries, the, the private sector of the three countries with the private sector of the United States and other areas, Uni European Union, hopefully, Canada and other um, of our partners as well. So there is a lot of attention and interest uh, uh, along this line. Thanks very much. Um, there are a couple questions from the audience about Nicaragua. Um, in your opening uh, presentation, uh, Minister Solano, you mentioned a lot of the trends that are underway in neighboring countries, um, authoritarianism, corruption, lack of transparency. So uh, the question is now that Daniel Ortega has been sworn in uh, for um, another term, um, how will you address the human rights um, crisis and the crisis of democracy um, in Nicaragua. Are you um, involved in any form of dialogue with the, with the either now or potentially um, with the government of Nicaragua uh, to improve um, conditions there? Um, and uh, related to that is, is a question about what is going to happen to Central American integration. Um, Nicaragua is a member of uh, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, um, and there are uh, requirements as part of a recent act passed in Congress um, that the Biden administration evaluate Nicaragua's continuing presence within CAFTA. So um, there, it's sort of a two-part question about Nicaragua having to do with whether, if at all, the alliance will be attempting to um, have some sort of dialogue with uh, the government of, of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo, um, and then related, what do you see as um, the potential, um, as the impact of, of Nicaragua's potential exclusion from the Central America Free Trade Agreement? Um, if anybody, perhaps uh, Erika, uh, whoever wants to start, feel free. Yeah. Rodolfo, do you want to address Nicaragua and I'll address SICA more generally? Sure, no, no, no problem. Let me, let, let me start with, uh, uh, with our point of view. Even in Nicaragua as a regional element, but uh, this is a worldwide situation. We need to be clear regarding with uh, the democratic institutions, the not only respect human rights, also to promote human rights. And I think this is a very important issue. We, we sometimes talk about respect of human rights, but you cannot uh, uh, um, exercise a good respect of human rights if you don't promote human rights. And of course, 
as I mentioned, freedom of press and, and, and speech. We, uh, we are, Costa Rica is a, a, a neighbor country of, uh, of, of Nicaragua. Uh, we have a, 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 a pragmatic approach. That pragmatic approach has two main pillars, of course, democratic institutions, human rights, and uh, freedom of press and expression is fundamental for us. But we need to continue working with all the international community to try to find the smart way how demo, uh, Nicaragua back to a more democratic life uh, in terms of the national institutions, the human rights, and the freedom of press. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, we are hoping that uh, the authorities of uh, Nicaragua can show in the short time a uh, good demonstration to understand the regional situations that demand that democracy, human rights, and freedom of press is the unique ID of the Central American region. Central American regions wants that the world knows us as a peace region, democratic region, a region that respects human rights and have a strong freedom of press. And we need to work together. And this, this needs a, a, a smart uh, a, a strategic approach with the international community. We need the, the different domestic uh, and internal actors in Nicaragua develop their own strategies, but also we need to support with different actors in the, in the region, with US, Canada, European Union, even uh, with, the, with, the, with other actors as the, as, the, as the Vatican. The possibility of establish a, a structured dialogue is in the table. As a diplomat, dialogue is always in the, in the table, but be clear that democracy, and I need to repeat these three words because sometimes we repeat this word, but it's the moment to understand the historical moment of understand these words. Democracy, human rights, and freedom of press are the main agenda that can provide, not only for Nicaraguan people, for all the region, the conditions to move for a very inclusive development that our people need. This is the main priority, and this is how we are approaching, talking with the different actors, with the uh, authorities in, in Nicaragua, in this uh, specific situation, how can we uh, work together to back democracy, human rights, respect and promotion of them, and freedom of press and expression in Nicaragua as soon as possible? Thank you. Uh, Consiglier Erika. Thank you. Um, I would start by saying that um, we cannot, the pandemic has forced all of us to look very much inwards. And we need to understand that there are pressing situations happening around us that also require attention. Nicaragua, as well as several other countries in our region, are a pressing priority that we need to make sure that there is constant engagement. So this platform is one ideal to make sure that we continue to engage and, and engaging not in just void uh, speeches that end up in nothing and don't translate into any results. Um, these, these, these situations are happening in our region are affecting all of us and it requires it's our responsibility to deal with them in an appropriate manner. So we wanna make sure that we continue to engage, we continue to uh, apply pressure and actually uh, drive a more humanitarian response and solution in several of the present situations that are happening around us. And, and I would venture also to say that we also need to recognize that aid, should be conditional on a country's democratic progress. And it is a fact that several countries, uh, if you want to equate uh, the progress of a country with, with democracy and the support 
we are not doing that right now. And we need to showcase that to make sure that people are truly embracing uh, the democratic process. And it's actually believed from the societies because commitment needs to uh, to be generated from the societies of each country, and then we as an international community support them. So those situations need to be, we need to make sure that are there. And, and as I mentioned, that the engagement is continuous. I think, again, with the pandemic, we will focus on and vaccines, we'll focus on economic recovery of oneself, and we're not concern and not realizing what is happening around us in our own neighborhood in our with our neighbors so um, to make sure that the attention continues to be present to make sure that um, it's all of the Latin American countries when you hear them out speaking they will all say well we believe in the multilateral process but multilateral process is not about a picture of many flags uh, there needs to be engagement. We need to make sure that we're coming to solutions and that we all of them are sitting at the table. So we believe as Nicaragua and all of the others, they need to be sitting at the table and we need to make sure that we're finding solutions for the situations. Uh, uh, may I add something, Cindy, very quickly? Please. Um, I just want to say, while we have uh, addressed the issue of Nicaragua and our declarations, and of other countries. I just want to make sure that I stress what uh, Rodolfo pointed out before, that uh, the Alliance is an informal um, organization, which means that we're not uh, trying to replace any multilateral institution. And what we do is we try to form um, uh, positions in common whenever possible in terms of our foreign policy, and then work towards established international organizations, whether it's the OAS, the UN, et cetera. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, individually or together, we may not try to persuade a particular country, but again, I wanna stress that it is not our intent to replace any existing institution and instead work through those and for example, for example, I'm sorry, and just to add, we took uh, similar positions, uh, both individually and within the OAS in terms of Nicaragua. We took similar positions in terms of uh, the BESIE, the Central American Integration Bank, in terms of loans to Nicaragua. We three voted exactly the same as well within the BESIE. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Roberto, there are a number of, of questions um, related to the existing Central American integration um, entities, um, SICA, the, the BESIA, um, uh, CAFTA, and others. So I think your, your, um, your response just now clarifies that. Uh, there have been a number of questions too about whether the economic integration aspects of um, the Alliance are also looking to South American countries. Um, and then related to that are, what is your approach to Europe, to the EU? Um, and is this uh, you know, an equal um, or a, a, a region of equal importance to the United States? I don't know who wants to take that. Um, we, we've identified strategic partners in the, in, um, in the various regions, and we're looking to liaise with them and interact. Um, the platform with the pillars that we've just mentioned, the political dialogue, the cooperation, and the investment and trade um, are very defined, and they are, as with the U.S., with the EU, with certain uh, partners in Asia, um, of interest to us, and we've we've had as well uh, strategic partners show equal amount of interest. So that is, I think, one aspect. And the other that I've seen that there are several questions whether other Latin American countries will join our alliance. 
Um, we have uh, among the three of us um, equal vote and we'll decide when the time comes and as, as each of the countries is showing interest, whether um, the, the framework is there, the, we share the same principles and the same values and whether it makes sense to include them. I think it's important to point out, uh, uh, Cindy, that this, again, not being a formal institution or organization, that it depends a lot on the interpersonal relationships. And I think that the one that we have formed, the three foreign ministers, has been uh, highly important but obviously not as important as the relationships that the presidents have started to develop. Um, and that is the cement, um, I think, that drives this organization at the moment. Um, so we have to move very carefully. Um, and we have a transition that you pointed out coming up in the case of Costa Rica. And precisely Costa Rica foreign minister and the president uh, Alvarado uh, selected the date of March 21st, precisely because it will be between the first and the second rounds of Costa Rica. So we will have, the presidents will have the opportunity to meet with the two uh, candidates, if there is a need for a second round, of course, um, with the two candidates and hopefully this will and begin to establish a, uh, a relationship as well with them so as to have a smooth transition. So we have to, again, just four months old, we have to move carefully before we, uh, we look elsewhere. But in terms of um, other partners, the European Union, well, the, the figures of our trade with the European Union places us in fifth place in Latin America in terms of importance, the three countries, in terms of trade balance with the European Union. And with Canada, I believe, I have the number somewhere, I believe, again, we're also fifth or sixth. So we will also be working in those directions as well, but we, there's a lot to do and we have to, you know, we have uh, to work with time. Um. Minister Solano. Yeah, just just uh, uh, briefly uh, regarding with all my 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 colleagues uh, already uh, mentioned, uh, just let's say that the aliens have just four months, you know, and we are just in the process of uh, learning how to to walk before running. Even our technical teams started this process since uh, nineteen uh, since since twenty twenty. Uh, uh, our technical teams in our foreign ministries started these discussions, then the ministers, and so, as, as Roberto mentions, the, the chemistry between our presidents are really, really important. But at this time, we want just to focus that the Alliance is uh, looking forward to establish a, st a strategic partnership with U.S., uh, in the next uh, summit in March here in Costa Rica. So that's why we are looking to, to come with a very high level representation of United States to have a very uh, uh, frank conversation with our head of states and informal, we uh, uh, identify uh, five main general strategic eight axes that we want to, to, to discuss with the United States that already my colleagues also mentioned in their uh, remarks. The first strategic axis is regional leadership that is regarding with democracy, human rights, and freedom of, uh, of expression, as I mentioned. The second uh, strategic axis is uh, regarding with migration and uh, refugee. The third is regarding with environmental, uh, sustainability, adaptation to climate change and oceans. The fourth is regarding with security, uh, justice and fight against corruption. And number five is regarding with economic growth and social, la social labor opportunities. I think this is just a five big umbrellas that can provide us a very good opportunity to establish a long-term agenda. We need to think in a long-term agenda 
with a, a strategic partner as we see all together with the United States. Thank you. Thanks. Um, a couple of questions about uh, what kinds of cooperation, collaboration are you considering on issues of corruption um, and organized crime? And related to that, if you could comment on the specific role of, uh, of organized crime in migration, uh, particularly the migration crisis that Panama um, has experienced and was reflected very dramatically, I think, in the figures that, um, that uh, Minister uh, Moines introduced at the beginning. Um, organized crime, common strategies, migration more generally. Um, the organized crime is absolutely interlinked with migration and, and you won't be able to manage migration if you're not tackling uh, these bands that are subtle. The, the truth is that while we've always had some form of migration going from South America to North America, it was a very minor number. And in the Uraba uh, Gulf, uh, there are certain cartels now that are encouraging uh, migrants to come. And tackling that, uh, we've been working with Colombia, we've been working with uh, whole Central America as well as South America. And we've already dismantled certain cartels that you could see that are not localized in one particular area, but they are already interlinked and interconnected. So the organized crime seems to have been coordinating better than, uh, than our uh, judicial system uh, or the various countries. So having that first step in the ministerial meeting that we convened here in Panama last year, the first one to ever deal with this type of migration, the two main task force, one was exactly that. It was the attorney generals and fiscals of all the countries to talk about it and start sharing information. It is impossible that one country can actually manage and take to the judicial because uh, you'll form a, a, some form of claim, you'll have some discharges by somebody, I, by, and by the time that you bring them to justice, that person has moved into the next country. So you truly need to collaborate and to share information at all times, and that I think is already, uh, or this initiative is already proving, starting to prove results, but there needs to only be a lot more cooperation in that regard. Others? Well, if I don't know if you want to add something, I have something very briefly to add. Um, I just want to underscore what Erika said about the, the relationship, strong relationship between organized crime and migration. Uh, this is something that uh, we need greater collaboration um, with the, all of the regional partners uh, in Central America and Mexico, and of course the United States. Um, I was recently in uh, Argentina just a few days ago, and um, I was talking with uh, Minister Ebrard of Mexico um, about the incident that happened at Chiapas where a truck, a trailer uh, overturned um, about uh, a month ago with a um, hundred and some migrants and uh, a number of them, many uh, were killed in the accident. Um, and they had a tough time identifying them um, because of the, uh, the condition of the bodies and uh, they had to work through fingerprints and so on. Anyway, eventually they found, uh, they determined the nationalities of, the, of those killed and there were a number of Dominicans uh, included in that, uh, in that accident. They had been migrating through Guatemala. Uh, there had been a, um, an agreement that uh, had been reached by the previous government with the Guatemalan government, uh, suppressing the need for visas. And um, organized crime had basically established this linkage and um, charging anywhere from between $10,000 and $20,000 uh, to take uh, these individuals all the way through uh, to the United States. Minister Ebrard told me this, in their estimate, this is a, that region, regional um, uh, mi migratory uh, route 
is estimated to pull in for organized crime around $10 billion. So we need to really start looking at this issue in, in, in greater depth because organized crime is many times one step ahead of the authorities. Um, we are pretty much out of time, but I'm going to ask one last question uh, for all of you to comment on, um, possibly in the same order that, uh, that the presentations were made, which has to do with um, whether you see the Organization of American States um, as an organization that is helpful in promoting the kind of democratic and human rights values um, that you have been talking about. And I would be remiss to not note the number of congratulatory messages that have been in the chat um, about the formation of the Alliance. I think that there is certainly um, a lot of goodwill and, and uh, number who, who wish you well. Uh, so if we could start with Minister uh, Muines and then uh, Minister Solano fin uh, finishing with uh, Roberto Alvarez, thanks. And, and very, very briefly, because we're out of time. So I, I would start by underscoring what Roberto mentioned, that um, this initiative is not meant to replace the OAS or the role that the OAS has played throughout, um, throughout decades uh, for Latin America. But uh, um, we have strength in coordinating our positions within the OAS and making sure that it remains a constructive dialogue and that um, we bring everybody to the table, as I mentioned, um, equating democracy with progress is important and making sure that everybody is at the table and following that kind of example and that the communities that are, are all embracing uh, freedom of the press, as for instance, Rodolfo mentioned, again, another example or pillar that we need to work through and make sure that it's getting to, to, uh, to be properly represented. Um, there is a larger role to play for all the ministers within the OAS and we've been talking and advocating to make sure that we all uh, embrace a more active and engaging role at the OAS to make sure that uh, we're driving the changes that we want to achieve. Thank you. Minister Solano. Oh, OES uh, is more than the DC. OES have uh, three main pillars that we need to continue working and supporting. Uh, the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission is a very important actor in our region. We need to support the commission. Second, we need to continue supporting the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Court is vital for the, the region. And of course, the electoral observation system that OES provides. Those three main pillars are the most important activities OES have in our region, and we need to continue working to support and strengthen those pillars. Thank you so much. And Roberto Alvarez, a former uh, ambassador of the Dominican Republic to the OAS. Last word. Well, uh, and also a, a member of sort of the secretariat for many years. So you're preaching to the choir here uh, and asking, I am just going to underscore what Erika and Rodolfo have said about uh, working through the OAS and other international organizations. Let me just add that we're also, we're, we're, we know, we realize that our uh, uh, working together can only um, have certain um, beneficial effect within in the areas of democracy, human rights, uh, and so on. Um, I think that the most important aspect is the demonstrative effect that our working together uh, can bring about in the region. That indeed you can grow, you can develop within a democratic framework. That respecting uh, democratic values human rights uh, and freedom of expression is essential in order to ob the, obtain the fundamental aspect on which our, all of our sort of human life basically is, is predicated, which is the dignity of the human being. Uh, and to us, that is the essential, I think, uh, fundamental component of our strategic alliance.
Thank you. With that final word, thank you to Roberto Alvarez, to Rodolfo Solano, to Erika Muines, to all of you who have joined us this morning for this um, fascinating, important conversation. Um, the video of the event will be on our website um, as soon as we can uh, get it uh, there for you. Uh, and I join many in the audience um, in offering my congratulations on this initiative and certainly um, wishing all of you um, the greatest possible success. So thank you very much. Thank you.